uh, Surface Navy Association. This is my second time. I was here last year, um, and I know this is a, a great opportunity for me as the Chief of Naval Research and as a Navy Flag Officer uh, that's wearing black shoes today um, to work together and explain and uh, have a dialogue with you. And so this is more of a dialogue versus a monologue. I've got about uh, 30 minutes of a discussion about the Office of Naval Research for those folks that may or may not be uh, intimately familiar with our mission. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the eye-watering technologies and discoveries uh, that are associated with surface warfare, but also in technologies that are domain agnostic. And then I'll take your uh, questions. So next slide. So the Office of Naval Research, science and technology, right? Not engineering and technology, but the science and technology for our Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, we are four commands in, uh, inside the Office of Naval Research. Uh, you can see the four logos there. The headquarters in Boston, about 1,000 scientists there. We've got uh, a special uh, projects office over in Bowling. We have an ONR Global Command, worldwide science and technology diplomacy, which we'll talk about. And then uh, the cornerstone, which most folks are aware of, which is our Naval Research Laboratory, uh, located over there in the, uh, um, the banks of the Potomac. About 4,000 strong uh, scientists and technologists. Uh, we have about a 10% footprint of active and reserve. My reserve component is an incredibly intelligent component. About 190 and 92% of them are PhDs. We're in the uniform. And they go back to be the chief technologists in small and medium and some large businesses. So it's a great spectrum of intellectual capital across our science and technology domain. About uh, $2 billion. That sounds like a lot of money, right? $2 billion. We have $17 billion uh, in our Department of the Navy's R&D account uh, annually. Two of that goes to science and technology. Uh, what we do is we break that up into uh, basic, applied, and advanced research. And we'll talk about how we do that and how we understand the fleet's need that ties back to the science to ensure we're lead turning the capability gaps that we don't even know about. 23 locations around the world and here in the United States and thousands of partners, and I'm looking at them right now, right? We have an S&T triangle, uh, triad of government, uh, industry, and academia. We leverage off of small, medium, predominantly, and large companies uh, from an uh, application perspective, and that discovery and invention predominantly are academic institutions, universities, and colleges around the world. We discover new knowledge. That discovery is incredible. I've been in a seat now for a year, and there hasn't been a day that's gone by where we haven't had a new discovery. That's just phenomenal. And that's not new information that perhaps Admiral Archerzell hasn't read in a book somewhere. I'm talking about new knowledge that's never been in anywhere other than some divine understanding. That discovery is the incubation for the development of breakthrough technologies. We knit together those technologies into feasible capabilities and then we determine, is that something the fleet can take today is that a technical risk reduction opportunity for a program or record? Or do we put it into the corpus of technology knowledge, what I call the shelf of technology? And we put all that together and uh, guided by an S&T strategy uh, that I'll talk about here on the next slide. Next slide. So uh, how do you invest in the squishy business of science and technology? And for you technologists out there or business uh, development folks in corporations where you have to go and you have to justify your budget to invest in areas that the return on investments measured in decades, that's a tough sell. Well, it's no different with us. But as you look at the ability to trace the DNA of discovery and invention, you have to show that S&T and science technology have equities in all three of our fleets and forces. And you see that along the x-axis. The current fleet that Hayes Gray and underway, we have S&T technologies and capabilities that can help our sailors today. Corrosion control, uh, autonomous pipe cleaning, right? I mean, these things aren't sexy, but the fact of the matter is there's technologies that are emerging out of this domain that can help our sailor today. And then we have our programs of record. We have acquisition efforts that are ongoing that take anywhere between a couple of years to a couple of a decades, or a couple decades. We need to make sure that we can provide technology on ramps. And so we have equities and programs and focus areas for that. And then the traditional fleet, which is that future fleet, right? 
32 years ago, I was coming out of the University of Notre Dame, go Irish. The fact of the matter is you come out, what was in the Petri dish and the test tubes then, right? We're fighting with today. So what should be in our Petri dishes and our test tubes? What are the flubber and flux capacitors of today that our generation 30 years from now are gonna be fighting the fight? And that takes some time and takes some thinking to make sure we're investing in the right areas. And I'm gonna talk about how we do that. So those boxes that you see there is our methodology to take that $2 billion and parse it up. Red box, discovery and invention, predominantly academia in areas of advanced material research or algorithmic phenomenology, photonic and quantum sensing research, some uh, bio-inspired and uh, synthetic biology uh, research. It goes on and on. It's an incredible amount. And all of this is open source. And for those that are interested, you can come to our website and you can see not only the current basic research that's underway, but the areas that we're planning to go into so that you can get a lead turn if you're interested. Those two center boxes are technology push. Nobody's asked for this, but we see the emergence of the basic research coming into an application domain that allows us to say, you know what? We should take that chocolate and that peanut butter and bring it together, it might be a good combination. And that combination comes into things like railgun, laser cannons, LDUUVs, cyber effects. Things that as they mature and we push it, yes, the fleet sees it and they start pulling it and we start to craft con ops and understand how it can be integrated into the current fight and the future fight so that we can establish either a program or record or do rapid prototyping. The gold box is my technology maturation pull. Those are that, those uh, opportunities that have fielded systems uh, torpedoes that are capable, but we're looking for a little more range, right? This isn't basic science, but this is still science and technology experiment and discovery in maturing the technology that can give a torpedo a, 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 within the same outer mold line an increased propulsion capability, for example. And those are our future naval capability activities. And then the blue box, as I mentioned, uh, we, we allocate a small portion of our resources to ensuring that we can look at manufacturing technology processes and see where can current technologies and science can help make them more efficient and actually help industry and the government come together to be more uh, productive in the uh, manufacturing. Okay, next slide. So when you remember those four colors, because I, I use those as a, uh, as a mapping across some of the rest of the brief. So I'm a big enterprise triad guy, right? You got a requirement and you got money, that's great, but who's gonna do the work, right? It's the old, uh, hey, you know, let's go, let's go take the hill, and that comes from here, and then it goes to the echelons, it comes down the echelon, it finally gets to the squad. The squad's gonna take the hill, right? So who's doing the work? You can see here the triad is our government engagement and our government scientists and warfare centers and system centers with our engineers. But we are reliant upon, as a triad partnership, with our industry partners and their academic professionals. It is not just uh, our folks at the Naval Research Laboratory or at China Lake or at Newark. And in that, we put together uh, the appropriate awareness and, um, and outreach initiatives so that you, those that are in industry here, can have awareness of what the science and technologists, at least in the Office of Naval Research, are working on today and what we're pursuing for tomorrow. So you can help craft your own business plans. And I'm gonna show you at the end of the brief here, how, if you don't know, how you can work with us, communicate with us, and keep us in your uh, solution space bin as we move forward. Next slide. Okay, so Chief of Naval Research. I get, call, I get two questions. One, what keeps you up at night and what are your priorities? What keeps me up at night is not the, uh, the high-end fight or actually the war fighting fight at all. That keeps up COCOMs and number of fleet commanders as it should. I'm not that. I'm the, uh, I'm the mad scientist of the Navy, right? I'm the chief of naval research. What keeps me up at night is the inefficiency of being able to discover new knowledge, mature technologies, and deliver feasible capabilities so our warfighter can fight the fight and win. And what we don't want to do is the duplication and find out that even within your own organization, we're duplicating effort. So that's where we focus on efficiencies. Not efficiencies in finding money and getting rid of money, but the science of science, which are my investment priorities, right? 
need to have the business of science efficiencies, right? It's the old adage of things are moving forward. Hey, boss, everything's great. Now it's time to put it on contract, right? Boom, we hit the belt sander of policy and we pull down, okay, I gotta do negotiation, T's and C's, I gotta make, we'll get this thing on contract in eight to nine months. Wrong, right? We've established uh, the ability within our authorities to accelerate the business of science in our contracting, in our funding, uh, in our engagement with partners, industry and academia. And we've already realized that over this past year and are moving things much more expeditiously to get into the science of science, bending of metal, writing of code, and so forth. Okay, so with that, you can see, you've now had an opportunity to read through the slide, investment priorities. Does that mean this is the only thing we're invested in? Absolutely not. Refer back to that four box chart, four box chart. We have $2.1 billion allocated across that, and we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10,000 projects ongoing at any one time, aligned across our focus areas and making sure that we are doing the appropriate science that gets us the technologies that then we can uh, work with the fleet to pull to, uh, uh, to inform con ops and requirements, uh, to reduce technical risk for programs, uh, and to ensure that fielded capabilities remain relevant. These five areas, though, are right now, as we look across the board with um, CNO Richardson, Commandant Neller, which are my two uh, uh, chains of command from a uh, operational engagement to ensure that the warfighters' requirements are being met. Uh, and then from uh, an acquisition s and perspective coming through uh, our service acquisition executive, Mr. Stackley, to the Secretary of the Navy uh, and into the OSD realm across um, uh, the s and folks there. We've looked across that. We've been part and parcel to the Long Range Research and Development Program Plan, uh, the third offset strategy uh, with DEPSECDEF, uh, and providing our forward-leaning looking areas. These areas are aligned to those, but they're also supportive of our Commandant and CNO. Directed energy and electric weaponry, some exciting investments, but more importantly, a, a very pr uh, good progress in maturing the technologies, and I'll talk about some of those. Cyber, the good thing about cyber is that you really don't know what's going on, right? That's a two-edged sword, right? You sit there and you go, well, you could say, I don't know if anything's going on, so I'm happy, or you can say, I don't know anything's going on, and I'm paranoid. What we've taken is a tact of a balance of that. A little bit of paranoia keeps you sharp, right? But at the same time, the sky's not falling. What we need to do is make sure we're looking across that domain and coming up with the algorithmic phenomenology, and that's a word or a phrase that we use to say, when you identify something in a cyber domain, even in an informational product, like our information technology product, it accelerates from a, a TRL a, a readiness level, technology readiness level of one to nine, ready for operational use almost overnight, right? There's no qualification, shake, bat, rattle, roll, any of that. It's ready to go. So this uh, investment priority, we are tightly tied into uh, Admiral Tai and her team uh, and other, um, other stakeholders uh, in the cyber domain to include our industry partners. But a lot of that is, is compartmentalized. So if you have ideas and engage um, opportunities in the cyber domain in those uh, full spectrum uh, networks communication and computational um, information, uh, please reach out to me or you'll, I'll, t I'll tell you how you can reach out so that we can keep that communication going forward. I, I, I anchor on cyber because that's one that uh, we end up really glossing over because of the classification. And though I won't go into the specifics, I want you to know that we're working on that. We have a good footprint of cyber S&T going on uh, and we need your help. Uh, on the EMW um, and maneuver warfare, I'm gonna talk about some of our uh, science that we're doing uh, in a couple slides, uh, as well as maneuver warfare. And then synthetic biology um, is a focus area. That's your Petri dish. That's my 20 year down range, right? Um, I've got uh, synbio uh, uh, geneticists uh, that have grown um, microbial energy cells uh, that can eat metallic material and poop electricity, okay? So when you start thinking about that demonstration, that's a discovery element, that's my red box. But if you start to think about how we can cultivate that, uh, put uh, metal uh, tracks on the seabed, uh, sprinkle this organic material on it and hook up electrodes to it. I have an endless supply of uh, power under the water, right? 
So when I said that, they go, well, I guess it could be that way. That, we're a long way off. I said, that's okay, I'm not gonna put that on a brochure. But I have to justify that red box. How do you justify, it'll be in the fleet in 20 years, sir? Well, you have to be able to say gallium nitride, for example, is now in the E2D radar and making sure that we can have high performance capability for uh, command and control radar search, uh, surface search for the carrier strike group. That came out of those kind of red box. So my synthetic biology focus is in that domain of the petri dish and test tubes. Next slide. Okay, I wanna, uh, I wanna give you an opportunity, especially industry partners and, uh, and my um, uh, Navy counterparts here, uh, teammates. Uh, the s and global engagement of the Office of Naval Research is is 55 countries strong. Look at those red dots. Those six red dots are where I have scientists stationed, right? PhD scientists stationed. Their mission is in country and surrounding countries to engage in the s and collaboration with the universities and colleges in that country and those surrounding countries to engage in open, search, uh, open research and basic research in those investment areas and in the research areas that are in our strategy. To collaborate and learn, but also to help minimize our technological surprise on the global stage. And it's very, very effective. Uh, in fact, this coming this uh, August, we'll be celebrating our 70th anniversary, August 1st, uh, of the Office of Naval Research and the establishment of the first global location in London. So we have London, we have Prague, we've got Singapore and Tokyo, we've got Sao Paulo and uh, Santiago. For those that are interested in the science of what we do, and you are in these areas, they're mostly co-located in consulates and embassies. And if you're a US citizen, you can go and you can visit our ONR Global and I give you an open invitation to do that. The other white dots you see, there are science advisors. And I have some here with me and uh, some uh, alumni science advisors. Uh, they are engineers and scientists uh, that are aligned and on the staffs of our numbered fleets and forces, our TICOMs, our Warfare Development Centers, OpNav, uh, and our SISCOMs. They provide the scientific advice, engagement, as well as the reach back to all of our Warfare Centers and System Centers to help define the solution space for our principals um, across those numbered fleets. It's a very good network and a very effective network. Uh, so I just give you that uh, quick snapshot of our global engagement. We do about 300 million, or excuse me, 300 grants, uh, about $100 million worth of work globally um, dedicated uh, with, uh, in, in this domain right here. Um, uh, across that uh, entire partnership, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2,000 international uh, industry and uh, colleges and universities. So it's a very extensive network and exchange of information. Next slide. Okay, so. I don't know, most of you probably have heard the valley of death, right? Well, as the Warfare Center Commander uh, wa uh, the Weapons Division in China Lake, which is in the northern Mojave, which is two hours away from Death Valley, right? I said, you know, we've got to turn the words around, right? No valley of death. Death Valley is actually a pretty great place to go. You've got life there. You've got, uh, you've got vegetation. You've got a lot of things in Death Valley. So I said, let's go understand this valley of death. And so we're not throwing confetti and saying that things, everything transitions. But when we started putting the data down on the table and to those four colored boxes for our investment strategy, you have these four pillars. We identified what transitions from knowledge to technology to capabilities. It's important to understand that, and this is in collaboration with industry and academia, right? Can't sit there and say we're 100% successful. In fact, I don't want to be 100% successful, not in the science and technology realm. You want to fail, fail fast, learn faster, and move forward. But we also have to understand that your second grader, when he or she graduates second grade, you shouldn't kick yourself in the behind that they didn't graduate and go to college the next year, right? Third grade, yes, maybe fourth grade, right? So. Half of what we do is that red box. And what we want to make sure is we're graduating, transitioning, right? The algorithmic phenomenology, for example, in that top graphic, to our SINMOC and the oceanographer of the Navy to ensure that their METOC models 
and other models needed to ensure that our fleet understands the domains and the environments they're going into continue to get better, right? That center, you know, I'm going to talk about a number of the gray. Um, that's our technology push. We are going to ramp up in FY16 and 17 the volume of technology push. And to do that, we have to have technology awareness. So that's going to, uh, it's an initiative, and you'll see a rollout of that, in, in, in fact, in a couple of slides. Uh, and then the others, we have rapid response. Uh, most folks are familiar with our Ponce laser uh, SSL uh, quick reaction capability. Um, some other uh, unmanned systems, unmanned system controllers. Uh, I talked about the corrosion and the pipe cleaners. Uh, we talk about uh, LED and deck lighting. Uh, there's a number of things that transition immediately. You go, that's not science. I go, no, it's not science, but it's technology, right? And so you got under we need to understand the spectrum well. And then how do we enable and ensure that the development teams that are taking your technologies are able to reduce risk and then expeditiously get operationally suitable and effective capability in our warfighters' hands. Next slide. Okay, so let's get uh, sort of focused down on surface uh, warfare domain. One of the things I talk to my scientists about, as we discover new things and the technologies start to emerge, it's absolutely essential to not stovepipe yourself in a domain, right? We need to be domain agnostic, almost like cost is an independent variable. Remember that a couple decades ago? In the agnostic, so that when we look at the technology, we don't disregard solution space because we're humans, right? So in this case, uh, what you see here, again, the four colored boxes, right? These are representative. It's not the 100%. They're the key S&T programs that are underway right now, executing and some that are finishing up. In the blue bars, those are those things that are getting out to our sailors right now. The gold or uh, yellow are our future naval capabilities, predominantly in mine countermeasures, in propulsion efforts, uh, the uh, top side uh, electronics, uh, some uh, uh, kinetic, uh, the hypervelocity projectile, uh, some things along those lines. I wasn't planning on going through each one. I'm going to talk about some of the choice ones here in a couple. And then uh, the gray are our technology push of our innovative naval prototypes. And then the Petri dish and test tubes are the, uh, the red ones. What I'm giving you is a, a sense. And for those that need and want to engage with the Office of Naval Research, we have taken the 10,000 plus projects that are currently underway and executing. And we've done the business of science to be able to bring them to the shelf, to be able to understand where they are, how they map to a certain domain, how they map to a certain capability, how they map to a certain industry partner, to a certain academic partner, so that we can have a dialogue with you to make sure we're not duplicating, but more importantly, where we can collaborate and move forward and get our warfighter what he and she needs. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about some of the cool science. I put this more in the capabilities uh, uh, focus uh, because when I, when I start talking about graphene, graphene, and uh, you know, nanoparticles, um, I can't see you because these lights are pretty bright, but I'm sure people go into high alpha or they roll their eyes out. Or, um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you about our innovative naval prototype engagements. Predominantly here, uh, that gray bar and the gray box. The electromagnetic maneuver warfare is a key area for Fleet Forces Command and our numbered fleets. We listen to our Fleet Force Commander and we engage to ensure that we're doing that left of the acquisition kill chain, science and technology, but in collaboration, coordination, and communication with the fleet. Briefing them where we can, engaging with the warfare development centers where it's appropriate, understanding the TICOM uh, support to the fleet commanders, and then bringing that together to make sure that this naval prototype effort that we're pursuing remains relevant. You can see on the top uh, schedule across, that's for our integrated topside INP. That is wrapping up in the next 18 months. That INP generated a set of uh, integrated RF functionality suites that were uh, aperture, a, a common set of aperture, uh, avionics and software packages 
to reduce the overall configuration of future ship uh, superstructures. We're still looking at and providing potential uh, um, solution space for backfit. The software products, and you can see each of those green um, triangles, those software products have been already rolled out. See what Block 2 is already uh, benefiting from uh, this innovative naval prototype. This is an incredible shift and an opportunity uh, to allow the technology, the algorithmic phenomenology to release the burden on our sailors and operators and allow the automation where it makes sense to timeshare, manage, and engage the electromagnetic capabilities, mostly in the RF spectrum, on our ships. It's important. And from that, we kicked off the EMC squared, which is the electromagnetic maneuver control capability. We just kicked that off. The idea there is leveraging off of that commonality and single aperture and software suite uh, and modular capabilities, be able to give the strike group commander um, and, and the other local commanders of, uh, of uh, the platform the ability to real time measure, assess, and then react to their own electromagnetic spectrum and footprint that they are generating, okay? And to have the ability to see everybody else's. Once we get to past that and we start talking about uh, the, the ones and zeros, it gets classified. The fact of the matter is this is an exciting, it's geeky, but it's an exciting uh, science and technology opportunity here, leveraging off the INTOP. And you can see in there where we have war game engagements with our weapons development centers and the fleet. Because in this science and technology, in these uh, software products, uh, what we experienced in INTOP was we expected 18 to 24 months of development, of, of, of discovery, invention, and so, and it accelerated in weeks. So we want to make sure we have our warfighter, as well as explaining an and, and awareness to our industry base, because these are going and will go into fielded systems. And those fielded systems are predominantly the OEMs, our industry base. OK, next slide. Next area, um, pillar, UXS maneuver warfare. Uh, most of you are familiar with our uh, swarming demonstration on the uh, James River uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, that was very successful. It was successful in demonstrating the software control algorithms, the controller interfaces, and the token ring learning uh, 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 algorithms for, in this case, they were, uh, they were boats, uh, but for the vehicle. And it was the first in a series of swarming technology demonstration, experiments and demonstrations. We have since given it the, uh, the acronym LOCUS, which is our low cost unmanned swarming technologies. We just demonstrated a 30 swarm UAVs, coyotes, the ability for um, not all airborne, um, some in, in simulation, uh, but to be able to communicate, cooperate, health and status, go severable, individual, small severable packages to full packages. This is a big deal, because it's not just about the software, it's about the learning. It's about the, the neural network science that's being injected into this locus uh, architecture. Uh, over this coming year, you can see in 2016, we'll be doing swarms of 30, 10 at, on land, and then 30 at sea. This, the sea domain and the maritime demonstration um, brings uh, some uh, physics uh, challenges uh, that we look forward to uh, discovering, and hopefully, uh, um, we, I know we will, uh, understand them. And that's about understanding. So these technologies, again, once again, is domain agnostic. And so as we get ready to think about our underwater vehicles, uh, we're looking at how some of this can transport into UUV swarming activities. Next slide. And that's our LDUUV. So 
This has been underway for quite some time, and there may be some folks out here that are getting ready to participate in the program of record LDUUV. That's not this, okay? This is still our innovative naval prototype for the LDUUV. Now, the science and technology and the maturation of this vehicle and the, the four vehicles total are helping reduce the risk, right? The three areas that this science and technology uh, uh, IMP is focused on is battery fuel cell technology, autonomous maneuver, and endurance. And we've made some incredible technological progress in all three of those. Uh, we are about to uh, execute a roughly 400 to 700 mile open ocean demonstration of one of our uh, LDUUVs um, from San Diego to San Francisco. Uh, in that, uh, we'll be using some of our advanced um, uh, battery technology to demonstrate its ability uh, to provide the, not only the power uh, for, um, uh, for the actual uh, transit, but for some maneuvering uh, 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 experiments that we're going to conduct. And in that, also our sense and avoid algorithms to understand how we can un, uh, ensure that vehicles at varying depths can dynamically sense and avoid obstacles fixed and moving uh, as we move forward. So it's an exciting demonstration, and we'll bring you that um, as we move forward. It, it, in the program of record effort, um, we are providing everything we learn uh, to the uh, technical team so they can reduce their risk. Uh, so I usually get questions about the program or record, um, and I'll, I'll point you towards the appropriate uh, acquisition leadership for that. Next slide. Okay, but surface, right? So uh, the ASW continuous trail unmanned vehicle, you don't see it there. Well, actually, you do. That's the active, for those folks that are familiar with the DARPA project, we are coordinating O&R and DARPA together, right, on a USV configuration that can provide a persistent, engaged, unmanned surface capability for multiple payloads and for autonomous and for manned and unmanned complementary capability engagements. We are going to pick up this technology and capability from DARPA in the 2018 timeframe. I asked my DARPA counterpart if we could uh, brief this colla uh, collaboratively. Our innovative naval prototype kickoff in FY18 will be the medium displacement USV. And in that, we will now look at, again, fuel, uh, fuel cells and batteries. We will look at payloads we will look at endurance, and we will look at, at sense and avoid, similar to what we're doing for LDUUV, because we're going to take those technologies from LDUUV and see how they are domain agnostic and are uh, applicable on our MDUSV. So we're, we're really excited about this. This um, uh, hull is going to get wet um, this year, um, and it's, we're going to be able to uh, watch and, and discover and work with our DARPA counterparts uh, to help our MDUSV get to a good start. Next slide. Uh, solid state laser. So out on the Ponce right now, our 30 kilowatt system continues to operate. Fifth Fleet Commander uses it on a daily basis, not only for SSL from a laser perspective, but also as an ISR asset with the advanced optics uh, that, the, um, uh, that the QRC uh, system brings to the table. With that, we continue to move forward, and we just uh, released the contract work um, for our technology maturation effort, which is what you see here. The objective there is to continue to mature the actual capability, but also look at uh, the beam uh, sharpener, beam director, looking at energy storage, advanced optics, doing the lethality analysis for uh, given target sets for laser energy uh, defeat to understand what is good enough, right? 
Right now, the objective of this TM effort in the FY19 timeframe is 150 kilowatt power. But when I ask my scientists, well, is 140 good enough? Do you need 300? Is more better? And the answer is more is better in certain cases. When you think about what we have to do, which is integrate this on shipboard platforms, swap C is precious. So we need to continue, it's a balance, or actually it's a ballet, as we continue to refine and get advances in energy storage, and that's a lot underneath our electromagnetic railgun program. We've brought that down significantly. We're using that same technology here. And then as we look at the new generation of uh, Zumwalt and other, and our next generation uh, ship platforms, and the types of alternative and next generation hybrid type generation or energy generation uh, uh, architectures, we're taking all that into account here and helping inform those requirements. I see, and the, the technology pull is um, not necessarily, necessarily a laser in every pot, but the laser capability and understanding how it can reduce the cost per kill. But right now we've got to ensure that the energy storage and the energy engagement um, is uh, that that technology continues to mature. And that's the focus on this. It's really exciting. Um, we'll continue to keep the Ponce deployed. Um, we've been given that opportunity to continue to support the Fifth Fleet Commander, and that will happen. We are pursuing um, other QRC-like science and technology demonstrations on other platforms and some land-based uh, uh, ranges to continue to uh, beat down the risk, but more importantly, mature the technology so that as, the, as we come into FY1920 timeframe, integration on our surface ships uh, can become a reality. Next slide. And then uh, uh, TURN. TURN is a, um, uh, a DARPA-led ONR uh, collaborative uh, effort uh, where we are looking at being able to take a vertical uh, launch and recovery, flying wing, right, to be able to, with, uh, 1, 000, you know, with, a, with a tactically significant payload um, amount, and be able to go at range off of surface ships. Uh, what we're really, that, that sort of sounds like, well, we've sort of done that. Isn't that engineering? Um, this. This flying wing, vertical takeoff flying wing, the stability and control, and the ability for the, uh, the desired uh, flight envelope uh, has never been done before. At least we say it's never been done, it's been tried before. Right? So maturing the technologies to actually demonstrate this, which is what we're going to do from 16 to 19, um, and be able to bring that uh, to a level of maturity that we can then uh, do prototyping and demonstration on fielded, uh, on, on current uh, ships uh, is the game plan uh, and the objectives. Okay, next slide. Okay, so for those that were hoping that I'd roll out uh, the actual, you know, flubber and flux capacitor or put, you know, bring out some neat tools that would light up and everything, um, I apologize for not meeting your expectations. However, what you can see is that we have an, uh, a substantial amount of science and technology efforts going on. We have it, the partnerships of academia and industry is absolutely essential. Our sister services across the Army, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps coming together to ensure that we're not duplicating our technologies. To understand all of that and where we're going, um, I encourage you uh, to visit our website and in this, the business of science, we have a, a standing uh, open BAA where we can take your ideas and we review those ideas on a regular basis and then we come back and we engage and we put money on contract and we move out, measured in weeks. For those that are interested in participating in the larger pro, uh, INPs and FNCs, the technical points of contact and the business points of contact are listed right there. So if you see something that you're interested in or something that you believe as it matures you would be interested in, 
I encourage you to engage those technical points of contact. The communication is absolutely essential. O&R does not have the corner market on great ideas. We got a lot of great ideas and we do a lot of eye-watering science and technology, those 4,000 scientists, but it's you. It's industry and academia together with us that are gonna really make the change. So I, engage, uh, I, I uh, encourage you to engage um, there or see any of the uh, uh, O&R reps that are here uh, after the uh, presentation. Next slide. Okay, my pinwheel. If you take anything away from this, uh, these icons give you a snapshot of the functionality in the science and technology across the board. These are uh, devolved out of our S&T strategy and they provide you a snapshot and the appropriate nomenclature and lingo inside uh, the spiral. Our, our codes are like program offices uh, and our Naval Research Laboratory and our Office of Naval Research uh, Global Commands um, are engaged in the day-to-day -day, uh, basic research and the global S&T diplomacy. So if any of that is of interest to you as you walk out the door uh, today or even in two weeks, six months from now, I encourage you to engage with us so that we can establish the relationship uh, and work together uh, for our common purpose.